this is the Samyut Nikaya. And there's 84 or 86 uh, suttas on dependent origination in this particular section. I'm going to read one section to you because this is very important for you to understand. At Sawati, monks as to those ascetics and Brahmins who do not understand these things, the origin of these things, the cessation of these things, and the way leading to the cessation of these things. Now, what I just said was, here's the Four Noble Truths in the length of dependent origination. And what are those things that they do not understand, whose origin they don't understand, whose cessation they don't understand, and the way, they, the way leading to, who, to whose cessation they don't understand? They don't understand aging and death. Dukkha, first noble truth. They don't understand its origin. Second noble truth. They don't understand its cessation. Third noble truth. And they don't understand wheat leading to the way of cessation. Now they don't understand all of the links of dependent origination. These are the things they do not understand. These I do not consider to be ascetics among ascetics or Brahmin among Brahmin. And these venerable ones do not, by realizing for themselves with direct knowledge in this very life, enter and dwell in the goal of asceticism or the goal of Brahminhood. So that says... If you don't understand the links of dependent origination, you're not going to attain Nibbana. And that's a lot different than the explanation of other people that use commentaries. In particular, the... Um, The practice is being taught in Burma known as straight vipassana. They say that when you get to a certain place, it's called uh, Sankaru Pekka, it's uh, equanimity to formations. Your mind becomes very balanced, everything is great. And then you'll have a kind of blackout. And you will see impermanence four or five times arise and pass away. Or you will see suffering four or five times arise and pass away very quickly. Or you will see anatta, imper uh, impersonal nature, four or five times arise and pass away and then you attain Nibbana. So that doesn't agree with what it says here. So what do you want to see happen? It says basically what you're asking. So, <coughs> Monk says to those ascetics and Brahmins who understand these things, the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation of these things. What are these things that they understand? They understand all of the links of dependent origination. They understand the origin, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation of each one of the links. So, dependent origination and the Four Noble Truths are connected. Each of the links is connected. 
in the uh, in the Vinaya, there is a small statement that says you can see one or all of the three characteristics of existence without ever seeing the links of dependent origination. But when you see the links of dependent origination, you always see the three characteristics of existence. So the idea that just seeing one of the characteristics of existence, that that leads to Nibbana is not quite as accurate as it could be according to the Buddha's teaching. And I wanted to bring that up to you. Now there's a, a lot of questions about what you look for in a teacher. And it tells you right here. Okay. This is how to find a teacher. Monks, one who does not know and see as it really is the origin and all of the links of dependent origination with the Four Noble Truths should search for a teacher in order to know this as it really is. So, this is telling you right here that if you want to find a true teacher, the teacher has to be able to explain how the links of dependent origination work. And this is real important to understand. This is the backbone of the Buddha's teaching. This is it. And this leads directly to the experience of Nibbana. So I wanted to bring that up so that you would understand that from the very first talk that I gave in the instructions, I was telling you about <laughs> the links of dependent origination. And a lot of you now understand that pretty well. And that makes me happy. And it's not because I'm so special. It's because you took the time to see how it works yourself. You are your own teacher. The guide can bring up some points for you to check out, but ultimately you have to do it yourself. You are your own teacher. And uh, many people, when they get done with retreat, they thank me for being their teacher and I'm not. I thank them for, for working so hard, for understanding this, so that you can have a liberating experience. But you have to understand you've done it yourself. I might bring up some suttas that make things clearer. I might say some things that make it a little easier to understand. But still, I'm not your teacher. And I don't like being put on a pedestal. Okay, because <laughs> once you get on a pedestal, it, it falls when you get off the, you fall off the pedestal for one reason or another. I don't like that. So I am your, what is called Kaliamita. I am your spiritual friend and I will help you in any way I can. <laughs> so that you can have these kinds of experience. 
So, <clears throat> in the in Nepali text society, this is five books. Bhikkhu Bodhi has a very strange sense of humor <laughs> because he puts it all in one book and this weighs four or five pounds, which doesn't really sound like a lot until you're going on an airplane and then it gets kind of heavy. And this was three books bad sense of humor. Okay, now tonight I'm going to read you the greater series of questions and answers. This is Sutta number 43, the Mahavidala Sutta. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pandika's Park. Then when it was evening, the venerable Mahakohita rose from meditation and went to the venerable Sariputta and exchanged greetings with him. Now, he didn't actually go just one person to one person and talk. He had students with him. That's why he asked these kind of, kind of questions. Mahakohita was always sitting in meditation. He was the foremost meditator. And he knew all these answers that he's talking to Sariputta about, but because they, they both had their students there, they would ask these questions. And they're actually quite interesting. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to Venerable Sariputta, One who is unwise, one who is unwise is said, friend, with reference to what is this said, one who is unwise. One who does not wisely understand. One who does not wisely understand, friend, that what it, why is why it is said. One who is unwise. And what does one, what doesn't one wisely understand? One doesn't wisely understand this is suffering. One wise, does not wisely understand this is the origin of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Now what he's talking about with not wisely understanding is how the Four Noble Truths and the links of dependent origination are intertwined with each other. So anytime you hear wise or uh, wisdom in Buddhism, and this is not a definition you're going to get in any other dictionary, in Buddhism it's referring directly to the links of dependent origination. <clears throat> That's why it is said, one who is unwise, saying, good friend, the venerable Mahakohita, delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Sariputta's words. Then he asked a further question, one who is wise, one who is wise, is said, friend, with reference to what was this said, one who is wise. I've already told you the answer to this. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend. That's why it is said, one who is wise. What does one wisely understand? One wisely understands this is suffering. One wisely understands this is the origin of suffering. One wisely understands this is a cessation of suffering. 
one wisely understands this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend, that's why it is said, one who is wise. Consciousness. Consciousness is said, friend, with reference to what is consciousness said. It cognizes. It cognizes, friend, that's why consciousness is said. What does it cognize? This is pleasant. It cognizes this is painful. It cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend, that's why consciousness is said. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And it is, is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them? Wisdom and consciousness, friends, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. For what one wisely understands, that one cognizes. And what one cognizes, that one wisely understands. You got it? <laughs> Don't all say one, yes at once. <laughs> Let's do it again. <clears throat> For what one wisely understands, you understand how the links work, that you cognize, you know, you're aware of it. You see how it works. And what one cognizes when you see how things work, you naturally wisely understand. Is that better? <laughs> and it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other to describe the difference between them because they are conjoined. That's how they work. It depends on your understanding at the time. When you think deeply about this and you hear someone either read it or say it or you read it yourself and you deeply, truly do go, ah, yeah, that's exactly right. It can be through word of mouth that you become a sotapanna, the first stage of awakening, by your understanding exactly what the sutta is saying. Doesn't happen very often because, well, we're kind of slow. I know I am. <laughs> I'm kind of slow, so I figure everybody else is going to be about the same. So we have to go through the practice of it. Okay? What is the difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness? These states that are conjoined, not disjoined. The difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, is this. Wisdom is to be developed and consciousness is to be fully understood. 
feeling. Feeling is said, is said, friend, with reference to what is feeling said. It feels. It feels, friend. That is why feeling is said. What does it feel? It feels pleasure. It feels pain. It feels neither pleasure nor pain. It feels, friend. It feels. That is why feeling is said. It's not my feeling. It's just a feeling that arises because the conditions are right for it to arise. And this is the same thing with every link of dependent origination. Okay? Perception. Perception is friends, is, is said, friend, with reference to what is perception said. It perceives. It perceives, friend. That's why perception is said. What does it perceive? It perceives blue, it perceives yellow, it perceives red, it perceives white. These are the colors in the Buddhist flag, if you were wondering. And what he's really saying here, there's no such a thing as blue color. That's a concept. All of these things are concepts. That is why perception is said. Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them? Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend. These states that are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. For what one feels, that one perceives. And what one per what one perceives, that one cognizes. Okay? That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined, and it's impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Knowledge by mind alone. Friend, what can be known by purified mind consciousness, released from the five faculties? Friend, by purified mind consciousness, released from the five faculties, the base of infinite space can be known. The base of infinite consciousness can be known and the base of nothingness can be known. Friend, what does one understand, with what does one understand a state that can be known? Interesting question. Friend, one understands a state that can be known with the eye of wisdom. What does that mean? No. The eye of wisdom is seeing whatever arises as part of an impersonal process. Because everything in dependent origination is impersonal. Right? So when you let go of craving, what are you seeing? The eye of wisdom is there. Because you see without thinking, you cognize very easily. Because your mind is pure. 
Your mind is bright. Your mind is very alert without any coloring of craving. That is the eye of wisdom. Now, a lot of people go to Kathmandu and there's a very famous stupa that's there that has a pair of eyes and has a, a curly Q thing coming right in the middle. And that's what it is, is showing you. See with the eye of wisdom. That little curly Q thing is actually uh, one of the marks of a great man. And what it is, is it's a very long hair that grows right there. And it was white and it was very, very soft. But it was one long hair. <laughs> Another interesting thing about the Buddha is that the Buddha had blue eyes. That's kind of an interesting little phenomena that not, be, not many people really understand. Now, you know, there's a lot of different Buddha images and the, they're doing this. What is the artist trying to show you that the Buddha is talking about? First noble truth, second noble truth, third noble truth, fourth noble truth. Mostly you see either this or this. Not very often do you see this. We're in the process of uh, having some made <laughs> in Sri Lanka. What the significance is they weren't black like every other Asians. What, what is, they were blue. Does it say that he has blue eyes in the Palatana? Yes. Okay. Why would I say that if no, I didn't? I, I, presume, I, presume that was the I I will give you the name or the the sutta to go look at it. <laughs> I think it's ninety no, ninety one. Yeah, Sutta, Sutta number 91 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is the 32 marks of a, of a, a superman, of a great man. <clears throat> Friend, what is the purpose of wisdom? The purpose of wisdom, friend, is direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. Its purpose is abandoning. Interesting, huh? Right view. Friend, how many can conditions are there for the arising of right view. Friend, there are two conditions for the arising of right view. The voice of another person and wise attention. This is not my voice that you're listening to. This is the Buddha's voice. He's the real teacher. These are the two conditions for the arising of right view. Friend, how many factors is right view assisted when it has deliverance of mind for its uh, path and deliverance of mind for its path and fruition? when it has deliverance by wisdom for its path and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. Friend, right view is assisted by five facu faculties, 
five factors, excuse me. When it has deliverance of mind for its path, deliverance of mind for its path and fruition, when it has deliverance by wisdom for its path and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. Here, friend, right view is assisted by virtue, keeping your precepts without breaking them. Learning, discussion, serenity, and insight. What am I teaching you? Tranquil wisdom, insight, meditation, serenity, and insight. A lot of you have had great insights, and they're not like the insights of the Mahasi method. The insights you have is how you personally see that you cause yourself pain and you decide, and we ain't going to do that anymore. <laughs> Let's let that one go. And you, you, you have these insights and they happen all the time. And it turns into kind of, and I wanted to call this, this, this meditation this kind of a name. I wanted to call it Oh, wow, meditation. <laughs> but I got vetoed. <laughs> so we're going to start up a magazine called Oh, Wow. <laughs> right view is assisted by these five factors. Has deliverance of mind for its fruit, uh, its path. Deliverance of mind for its path and fruition. It has deliverance of mind by wisdom for its path and deliverance by wisdom for its path and fruition. Friend, how many kinds of being are there? There are three kinds of being, friend. The sense sphere being. Now, I've changed the word being to habitual behavior. But the reason I do that is because it's easier to understand when you're first starting out. It has other definitions too, and it doesn't match so well with habitual behavior. But I've gone to many different, very, very learned scholarly monks. And I ask them to talk about bhava, which is a Pali word for what Bhikkhu Bodhi says is being. And as they were talking and describing all of the different aspects of this, in my mind I was replacing it with habitual tendency or habitual behavior, and it worked. And then I would tell them, you know, what you just described, I'd describe it in different words, and I would say, now I want, to, I want you to listen to this. And then I would give them what I thought habitual behavior was as bhava, and they, they agreed. And when I talk about very scholarly monks. My teacher was Usila Nanda. Before he was 27 years old, he memorized this many books. And when I say memorized it, I mean he had it down cold. And then he took a test on it. And the test is, okay, this is the Majjhima Nikaya, number 390, uh, page number 390, the Mahavidala Sutta, and I would read one line, <coughs> continue. And he did. Now this test in Burma is such that 
if you make six mistakes, you failed. He didn't make a mistake. Now this is with 12 books. And that's half of the test. The other half is a written test. And it's very comprehensive, the kind of questions he was asked. And he was number one in Burma of all the monks that took the test that year. He's one of them that I talked to about this. I also talked to a monk that was really, really famous. He was even in the, the World Book of Records for the best retentive memory. He memorized the entire Tipitaka. And you know, you, you, you're in college and you have to go take a final test and it's four hours of real hell. Well, with what he had memorized, he took a test 10 hours a day for 30 days in a row. And he got 90% correct. And I talked to him about this. So I, I, when I'm talking about, I went to very scholarly monks, this gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. That's one of the reasons I spent 12 years in Asia, is looking up these kind of monks that, that have this kind of mind, that I could really delve into interesting questions. At least they were interesting to me. It was actually good fun. Unfortunately, a lot of the teachers that I had are now dead. I went to not only Burmese monks, but I went to Sri Lanka monks. I went to Thai monks. And quite often I had to go through translators, but that was okay because the people I asked to translate were monks and they understood what, what we were talking about. And that's really important. <clears throat> so, there is the sense sphere being, the immaterial being, or the fine material being that means the devas and brahma lokas and things like that they have a we have a gross body they have a fine material body that's why you don't see them hanging around even though they do there are devas that come for dhamma talks they are in the room right now and immaterial being. Friend, how is renewal of being in the future generated? Renewal of being in the future is generated through the delighting in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. So there you see what I, what I was talking about. Ignorance and craving. Those are the two things that we want to let go of. Relax. 6R. As much as you can remember. Keep 6 Ring. Now I insist upon saying that a lot in the Dhamma talks. And the reason I say it a lot is maybe... When you get out into your daily life, you'll even remember it. And maybe, by chance, use it. When you start to have a headache, what do you generally do with that? Start looking for some aspirin? 
when I was in Burma, I started to get a real deep headache. And I went to them and they gave me an aspirin, one. I cut it in half. I used it and it screwed up my meditation for the rest of the day. So I kind of back away from using things like aspirin or any drugs for that matter. I much prefer the natural approach to a headache. You start to feel a headache, start relaxing the tightness in your neck, start relaxing the tightness in your head. Watch how it disappears. Now I've been a monk for 28 years. I've had less than five headaches that didn't go away in 28 years. Can you say that? But when you remember to use the six R's, that can help you a lot. This is something that you carry with you all the time. I try to get you to smile all the time. Why? Because when you go out there and you're smiling more, your mind is light, your mind is bright, and it's easy to see when hindrances come up. It's easy to let them go. I don't care if it's a physical hindrance or a mental hindrance. You can relax into it. This stuff works, not just while you're practicing here. This works all the time, if you remember to use it. You know, anytime you have repeat thoughts, guess who is suffering? And guess who is causing them self-suffering? And why not use the six R's and start letting that kind of nonsense stuff go? Let the rubbish take it out. No need. Friend, how is renewal of being in the future not generated? Can you guess? <laughs> with the fading away of ignorance, with the arising of true knowledge, with the cessation of craving, renewal of being in the future is not generated. Pretty simple. Now we're going to talk about the first jhana. What is the first jhana? Here, friend, quite secluded from sensual pleasures. Secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. This is called the first jhana. Everybody here has experienced jhanas. Do you understand how incredibly nice that is? Because you have experienced such a wholesome mind, if you never do any more mental uh, development for the rest of your life. At the time of your death, you're going to remember that joy and that peace and that calm and you will die very peacefully. And you will be reborn in a Brahma Loka just from having that experience one time. So this is, this is amazingly powerful stuff. Now, most of you 
have experienced going into the arupa jhanas, into the immaterial realms, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing, neither perception nor non-perception. If you don't attain Nibbana in this lifetime, and you have one of these immaterial jhanas, let me give you a, an idea of what will happen for you. In Buddhism, there's something that's called an asankhaya. It's a length of time where it's a 10 with 160 zeros behind it. That's how long it is in years. So it's a pretty long period of time. Now, the universe, what it does is it expands for one asankhaya. And then it stops for one asankhaya. And then it contracts for one asankhaya. And then it stops for one asankhaya. Now, these four asankhayas are called It just <laughs> a mahakapa. And my mind just went blank for a moment. Now a mahakapa is ten with five hundred and sixty zeros behind it. That's how long one mahakapa is in years. When you get into the of Rupa Jhanas. If you go no higher in this lifetime than infinite space, you will be reborn in an immaterial realm that lasts 20,000 Mahakapas. That's how much good merit that you're making for yourself right now. If you go no higher than infinite consciousness, that's 40,000 Mahakapas. You go to the realm of nothingness, 60,000 Mahakapas. You go to neither perception nor non-perception, 84,000 Mahakapas. Now that's a long time. I mean a real long time. That's how much merit you're making by doing this practice right here, right now. It's a pleasurable realm that you're in for that long because you're doing so much good merit by keeping your mind pure. So that gives you an idea of what we're actually working with here. I tell you, okay, radiate loving kindness for um, all the different beings and then start radiating loving kindness for all beings in all the directions, which basically means the fourth jhana. If you know, go no higher than that, you will be reborn in a realm that lasts for 500 Mahakapas. It's a lot of merit that you're making by purifying your mind right here, right now. And of course, I want to push you to go further so you don't get off the wheel. You don't have to be reborn. But this is this is what, what you're you would experience if you don't ever do any more in this lifetime. You've already got this experience. And I want you to go more. So how many factors does the first jhana have? Friend, the first jhana has five factors. Here, when a monk has entered upon the first jhana, there occur thinking, examining thought, joy, happiness, and unification of mind. 
There's five things that happen when you get into the first jhana. Friend, how many factors are abandoned in the first jhana? And how many factors are possessed? Friend, the first jhana, in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned. What are the five factors that are abandoned? The five hindrances. Lust, greedy mind, hatred, aversion mind, sloth and torpor, restlessness, doubt. When you're in the first jhana, or you're in any of the jhanas, these kind of things won't arise. But when your mindfulness gets a little bit weak, guess who comes for dinner? Gonna eat you up. The hindrance arises. Now you have to work with the hindrance, let it go, and then you get back into the jhana. But the hindrances are a necessary part of the practice because every time your mindfulness gets weak for whatever reason and a hindrance arises, it's helping you to go deeper. And it's teaching you how this process works. So it's a real interesting thing that these five factors are abandoned while you're in the jhana. And when you're not in the jhana, these five factors pop up at you. They get you. And that's good. And five factors are possessed. Here, when a monk has entered upon the first jhana, sensual desire is abandoned. Ill will, aversion, is abandoned. Sloth and torpor are abandoned. Restlessness and anxiety are abandoned. Doubt is abandoned. See? And there occur thinking, examining thought, joy, happiness, and unification of mind. That is how the first jhana in the first jhana, five factors are abandoned and five factors are possessed. Friend, these five faculties each have a separate field, a separate domain, and do not experience each other's field and domain. That is the eye faculty, ear faculty, nose faculty, tongue faculty, body faculty. They each have their own field. You don't smell with your eyes, right? You see with your eyes. You smell with your tongue. That it has its own domain. It has a, each one of these has its own thing. Now these five faculties, each having a separate field, a separate domain, do not experience each other's field and domain. What is their resort? What experiences their fields and domains? These five faculties each have a separate field, a separate domain, and do not experience each other's field and domain. That is, the eye faculty, ear faculty, nose faculty, tongue faculty, and body faculty. Now these five faculties each have a separate field, a separate domain, not experiencing each other's field and domain. They have mind as their resort. Mind experiences their fields and domains. That's why there's six sense doors. Friend of these five faculties, that is the eye faculty, ear faculty, nose faculty, tongue faculty, and the body faculty, what do these five faculties stand in dependence on? Interesting question.
friend as to these five faculties, that is the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body faculty. These five faculties stand, stand in dependence on vitality. Friend, what does vitality stand in dependence on? This gets tricky in a minute, you'll see. Vitality stands in dependence on heat. Friend, what does heat stand in dependence on? This one's going to get you. Heat stands in dependence on vitality. Just now, friend, we understood the Venerable Sariputta to have said vitality stands in dependence on heat, and now we understand him to say heat stands in dependence on vitality. How should the meaning of this statement be regarded? Now, that's a decent question, don't you think? <laughs> In that case, friend, I shall give you a simile for some wise men here understand the meaning of a statement by means of a simile. <clears throat> Just as when an oil lamp is burning, its radiance is seen in dependence on its flame, and its flame is seen in dependence on its radiance. Got it? So too, vitality stands in dependence on heat, and heat stands in dependence on vitality. You can't have one without the other. Friend, are vital formations things that can be felt, or are vital formations one thing and things that can be felt another? Vital formations, friends, are not things that can be felt. If vital formation were things that can be felt, then when a monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness would not be seen to emerge from it. We'll explain that in just a bit. Because vital formations are one thing, and things can be, that can be felt another. A monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness can be seen to emerge from it. Friend, when this body is bereaved of how many states is it then discarded and forsaken and left lying senseless like a log? Friend, when this body is bereaved of three states, vitality, heat, and consciousness, it is then discarded and forsaken, left lying senseless like a log. Friend, what is the difference between one who is dead who has completed his time, and a monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness? Interesting question. Friend, in this case, one who is dead, who has completed his time, his bodily formations have ceased and subsided, his verbal formations have ceased and subsided, his mental formations have ceased and subsided. His vitality is exhausted. His heat has been dissipated. His faculties are fully broken up. In the case of a monk who has entered upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, his bodily formations have ceased and subsided. His Verbal formations have ceased and subsided. His mental formations have ceased and subsided, but his vitality is not exhausted. His heat has not been dissipated. 
his faculties become exceptionally clear. That is a difference between one who is dead, who has completed his time, and a monk who has emerged upon the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Now, some, uh, some of you, when you've come in for an interview, I say, your face is really bright. What do you think I'm seeing? I'm, I'm seeing the vitality and I'm seeing how clear your mind is. And there are some people that their face gets so bright and so clear that you don't need to have light in the room because you, you see and there is a glow around them. Their face becomes amazingly clear and bright and really wonderful to see. Now, when you get to the third stage of awakening called anagami, you will be able to make a determination to sit in meditation in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness for up to seven days. And right here it says anybody that's sitting in this, their their features become exceptionally bright and clear. So if you happen to run across somebody that when you look at them, it's like their face is so beautiful and their the light coming off them is so strong, give them something. They have just been sitting in the highest amount of merit that you can make as a human being. And giving them a gift, the merit that you get for doing that comes back a lot. Now there's a story about Sariputta. He was an arahat. He could sit for up to seven days, just like I was saying. And he would do that occasionally. And he would sit in neither perception, or he would sit in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness for seven days. And when he came out, he would generally look for people that are very good, but not necessarily well off, and go on alms round and give them the opportunity to give to him. And he did this one day. And he went off and there was this poor farmer. Between he and his wife, they had one shirt. So he was out plowing his field without a shirt on. And his wife had made some, some food for him for for lunch and he came she came to give him the food and she did and he saw Sariputta and he decided it was more important to give the food that little food that he had to Sariputta and also his wife came with some water and she donated some water to Sariputta and Sariputta sat down and ate the food and drank the water and got up and left. And they turned around and looked at the field that he was plowing and it had turned to gold. And he didn't know what to do with all that gold. So he went to the king and he said, I've got a lot of gold out in my field. How about if you help me and, and uh, find a place to store it until I can figure out what to do with it. So the king set out some people with carts, and some of his helpers and such. And as they were picking up the gold, they were saying, this is a king's gold, and it turned back to dirt. 
And they saw that that happened and they said, we can't say that. This is this farmer's gold. And they filled the carts up and he became exceptionally wealthy because of that gift. So what I would suggest, if you happen to run across anybody that really has a very bright radiance about them, give them food. Give them something to drink. Give them anything you can. And the amount of merit that comes back for that is really a lot. Yeah. Is this a safe retirement plan? <laughs> <laughs> is what? Is this a safe retirement plan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would think so. <laughs> No, don't touch monks. So it's it's a, a huge amount of merit that you make when, even when you experience this blank out for a short period of time. Your mind is as pure as it possibly could ever be and still be alive. Okay. Now we're going to talk about deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there in the attainment of neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind? Friend, there are four conditions for the attainment of neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind, here with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief. A monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. These are the four conditions for the attainment of neither painful nor pleasant de deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind? That's going into the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Friend, there are two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs and attention to the signless element. These are the two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Friend, how many conditions are there for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind. There are three conditions for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs, attention to the signless element, and the prior determination of its duration. So before you go into this state, you make a determination, depending on how much time you have at the time, that you're going to sit for four days, 12 hours, 16 minutes, 31 seconds. And then you come out at exactly that time. And it goes up to seven days. Over seven days, your vitality disappears, your heat dissipates, and body dies. <laughs> so it's, it has a time limit on it. And I have met monks that tell me that they sat in that, that state for two weeks. And I look at them and I go, maybe. doesn't understand what kind of states he was in. So my yoga teacher said he sat uh, in uh, a 
in your pajamas for up to two weeks. Arupa jhanas, yes. possible. Cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, no. <clears throat> and even that I would question. Somebody sat for two weeks. It's, it's not easy sitting that long. <laughs> It really isn't. <laughs> uh, I had a teacher that I went to see in Australia, and he sat for three days. But he still moved a little bit. He wasn't sitting like the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. But he became very famous because of that. And sitting for three days, it is it puts you through some changes. It really does. Friend, how many conditions are there for the emergence of the signless deliverance of mind? There are two conditions for the emergence of the signless deliverance of mind. Attention to all signs and non-attention to the signless element. These are the two conditions for the emergence of the signless deliverance of mind. Friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind, the deliverance of mind through nothingness, the deliverance of mind through voidness, the signless deliverance of mind. Are these states different in meaning and different in name, or are they one in meaning and different in name only? Friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind, the deliverance of mind through nothingness, the deliverance of mind through voidness, the signless deliverance of mind, there is a way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name, and there is a way in which they are one in meaning and different in name only. What, friend, is a way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name? Here a monk abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. Sound familiar for some of you? Mm -hmm. So above, below, around, and everywhere. Sound familiar? Kind of like the instructions I was giving you? Hmm, imagine that. <laughs> To all as to himself, he abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving-kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill-will. He abides pervading one quarter of his mind with compassion. He abides pervading one quarter of his mind imbued with joy. He abides pervading one quarter of his mind imbued with equanimity, likewise the second, the third, and the fourth, so above, below, around, and everywhere, as to all as to himself. He abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is called the immeasurable deliverance of mind. And what, friend, is a deliverance of mind through nothingness? Here, with the complete surmounting of the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This is called the deliverance of mind through nothingness. And what, friend, is a deliverance of mind through voidness? 
Here a monk gone to the forest or to a root of a tree or an empty hut reflects, this is void of a self. Or what belongs to a self. This is called the deliverance of mind through voidness. Now this particular practice you can do on your own. Everything that arises, you remind yourself, it's not mine, not me, not myself. And you don't have to use those three statements. One of the things that I, I, I practice this for a while, just to, so I could be able to teach other people, and the statement that I used was, where am I? Am I these thoughts? Am I these feelings? No. Nope. Where am I? Everything is impersonal. There is no personal self in anything in this phenomenal logical existence. but we sure believe we, there is. And what, friend, is the signless deliverance of mind? Here, with non-attention to all signs, a monk enters upon and abides in the signless collectedness of mind. This is called the signless, signless deliverance of mind. This is the way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name. And what, friend, is the way in which these states are one in meaning and different in name only? Lust is a maker of measurement. Hate is a maker of measurement. Delusion is a maker of measurement. Lust, I like it. Hate, I don't like it. Delusion, I am that. Another way of saying what? Craving. In a monk whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with so that there are no more, they are no longer subject to future arising. All of the kinds of immeasurable deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind, the pronounced, is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, void of delusion. No more craving. Lust is a something. Hate is a something. Delusion is a something. A monk whose taints are destroyed these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, so that they no longer are subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of deliverance through nothingness, the unshakable deliverance of mine is pronounced the best. Now this, uh, that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, and void of delusion. Lust is a maker of signs. Hate is a maker of signs. Delusion is a maker of signs. A monk whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of signless deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, 
void of hate, and void of delusion. This is the way which these states are one in meaning and different in name only. That is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The Venerable Mahakohita was satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. Interesting sutta. One of, one of the ones that I really like. <laughs> trying to frame the question. So the word, uh, how is he using, is he using sign to mean object? Nibita, any, any kind of thing. Any, yeah, any kind of object. Any, any kind of material object or mental object. So it could be a formless object. I mean, it could be formless or formless. Or real. Mm. So what are you really asking? <laughs> I was just relating it to what I've been experiencing. Ah. Uh, because there are states where there are signs and objects and then states A disappear. But there's still something there. There's something there, but yeah. it's formless. So that's why I was saying Well, that. mind is formless. Right? Yeah. And you take mind as your object of meditation. So it's still right. It's still a sign. Right. Any kind of movement or disturbance is a sign. When you have that cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, that's the signless. There's no signs that arise. When you come back, you're real happy because of that. And that's how you see the links. So then I, <coughs> any, any, any consciousness, um, formation, the, any, any consciousness is, is then a formation or a sankara. If it's an object, it's a sankara. Well, if there's well, uh, well, just let let me think it through for a minute because there's a lot of different definitions here that I have to work with. Yes. <laughs> well, that's part of the that's the, that's has to do with the links. Right. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. I mean, it's a practical term. Yeah. yeah. But there's a there's a lot of different definitions that we have to run through before I can give you a real. Yeah. So Don't I'm ask me for the definitions. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> can happen at any time from the first experience of a jhana. But it, it one doesn't have to be sitting, it could be... Really no, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll feel it coming on. You'll feel your mind starting to go like this and that's the time to pull over. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not a traffic jam. <laughs> I have a, a, a question that comes from ignorance. Um, I, I'm very puzzled, and I was hoping that you could explain to me what is accumulating merit. Not what is it, but what actually is accumulating merit. What merit itself.
really could do this better with glasses on. Okay, this is the, the shorter exposition of action. Now, merit is good action. Okay. 135. Maybe if I can get to it. There it is. Does somebody ask the Buddha... Uh, what is the cause and condition why human beings are seen to be inferior or superior? For people are seen to be short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor, wealthy, low-born, high-born, stupid and wise. The Buddha's answer to that Beings are owners of their actions, life continuum. Heirs of their action, they originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings, different beings for different stations in life, things like that. Did that help? It continues by itself because of the actions. From lifetime to lifetime. Yep. <coughs> okay. It comes down to it has a physicality and faith in it and how it works. So we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Getting back to consciousness. Yeah. Um, consciousness, feeling, and perception are conjoined. Yes. And each one of those have the craving in it. Yes. The devil in it. The, everything that arises has some craving in it. Every, every link that arises has some craving in it until you finally let it go all the way. In, in essence, yes. And then you get into cessation of the perception, feeling, and consciousness. Can't, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, given the Sun Fisherman um, Sutta, what, um, what is it that you're talking about that is um, reborn in? Your actions cause you to be reborn. It's a life continuum thing. Your craving causes you to be reborn. Your ignorance causes you to be reborn. That's what I just got through reading. Yeah. That's all that's all common. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not gonna I'm not gonna go there. Mm. It's 
that's why I don't I, I don't try to discuss what Nibbana is. How can you talk about something with only conditioned ideas and words and when it's an unconditioned state? And I, I know monks that they write a letter to me occasionally and they never use the word I because I don't want to be attached. <laughs> they, they, they say their name every time instead of, I just saw this and I thought it was interesting. They say, well, Bhante so-and-so saw this and he thought it was interesting. Yeah, it, it's it's just odd ideas about language. Language is very difficult because you're trying to experience something that doesn't have any concepts in it. I've had a lot of students come up to me when they I discuss Sutta One One One, all of the different jhanas that you can experience and that sort of thing. And they say, you know, you explained it very clearly, it's very accurate, and it's not even close to the actual experience. And it's true. It's not even close. But you got to use words to get across some things, and some things you can't. So you try the best you can and see how it goes. That's about all you can do. <clears throat> Anybody else? Yeah. You know, we heard about this uh, Angulima story. It could be a Dhatra story. Is it in the Sutta about Buddha's time that Angulima even became Rahat? Yes, it's in the Angulimala Sutta. So in the modern days, if you take someone who has been doing like slaughtering animals, rotting and all bad things, and if the person realizes after so many years that I'm doing the wrong thing, I want to do the right path, if the person doesn't have accumulated merit from past lives, so nothing, they, they wouldn't still, try like, to... That person be, you know, right, you know, get into a higher level? There was a time during the, there was a man during the time of the Buddha that he was a thief and he was with 20 other people that were thieves and they got taken to the king and the king said, well, you need to be executed. I'm going to cut all your heads off, but he didn't have an executor. And he asked the thieves, well, is, are any of you willing to do this, to become an, ex an ex executor? And this one man said, yeah. So he just started lopping people's heads off for a lot of years until he wasn't strong enough to do it anymore. Now, it, it was during the time of the Buddha, and one time, Sariputta, was out on alms round and he saw Sariputta and he put a little bit of rice, I mean not very much, just a little bit in his bowl. And when he died, they went to the Buddha and said, where was he reborn? He said he was reborn in a, in a heavenly realm, in Devaloka. I think it was probably the uh, Tavza heaven. And he said, he killed hundreds and hundreds of people. How can he be reborn there? And he remembered at the time of his death the happiness he experienced by sharing some food with Sariputta. That doesn't mean at some point later he's not going to suffer from all of those killings. So, you know, you hear about all of these people, these rich people, and they're really nasty, and they 
they cause all kinds of problems for other people and they keep getting richer and richer and you go, well, that karma should be coming back at them. They should be killed for this or that. Well, their karma is such that they're burning off their good karma and creating themselves an awful lot of bad karma and that will come back. It's a balancing act. It does happen. The trick is everybody wants to know when. <laughs> and it depends when the conditions are right. Good and bad action will take care of itself. I said not to worry about that. Don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah. Everything In Abhidhamma, it talks about 24 causal relationships of karma is one of causal relationships. You want to find out more about it? I'll give you a book. You can read it if you can understand it. Somebody else is asking a question. I have the same question, and the way I came to terms with it was the same, like he had it coming. Everyone has it coming, but people focus about when it's coming, they forget that the present moment, we have this coming too. And you should let go of the attachment of when you have it coming and focus on that you have this coming right here. Well, and you have a choice to make whether you're going to go this way or that way. Don't worry about That's right. when it's coming. Just yeah. find it in the present moment. Right. Just your experience, Timbana, does that probably clear up some of the confusion for you about what gets reborn? Well, body and mind gets reborn. What condition is it going to be reborn in? Depends on past action. When the conditions are right, things happen in a particular way. Yeah? Is body reborn in the heavenly realms? 
fine material. Kind of, it's not reborn, it's kind of just materializes. You wind up with a body that's like a, a teenage body where you're ready to romp and play and sing and dance and do all kinds of good fun stuff. But in the Deva Loka, you have to eat every day. And what they eat is grapes. It, they just appear, you have to be munching on the grapes. If you don't eat, what happens is the, uh, the heat gets too big and the body dies. So you have to eat every day. But when you're practicing meditation, you're in the Brahma Lokas and their nourishment to keep body alive is joy. So you just have to have some joy come up every day, then you keep going, yeah. There's a few, but I mostly let all that stuff go because it's not interesting to me. The first sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, it goes through every one of the 32 realms of existence, or 31 realms of existence. Boring. <laughs> So anybody that, that gets a copy of the Majjhima Nikaya, I told them, do not read, start out by reading the first sutta. If you try, you'll put the book down and never pick it up again. <laughs> and that's, that's really true. You can see it for yourself. When you get to certain places in your meditation, you can go visit these. <laughs> By developing your mind in such a way? I just said, wow. Oh, I thought you said how. <laughs> It's one of the finest pieces of writing about the Buddha and what the Buddha taught and the impact he had in this world. And um, if you don't read anything else, the introduction is rather... It's, it's se like 75 book. pages or yeah, something but like it that. It is a, probably the single most wonderful work on the subject that I ever read. And some of his ideas don't match what it says inside the suttas. <laughs> some of his ideas are influenced very strongly by commentary. So you have to read it with a, I, I a, a grain of salt. Yeah, I noticed that too. And yeah. He puts that parenthetically in many cases. Yeah. But it is good. It is good. The next two are pretty next to concept and reality, it's one of the better better things to read. What the Buddha taught by uh, Rahula is also one of the fine. Yeah, that was one of the first books I ever wrote or ever read on on Buddhism. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long it's how much longer it's going to be, but I've already it's already been paid for. Everybody is just waiting. So. And we'll we'll put it on the on the website that it's available and anybody wants a copy, we can send it to you. Do they have 
Buddha sculptures in Sri Lanka because I'm a landscape architect and maybe I could order some how, projects. How, how big do you want it to be? <laughs> really? <sighs> I need a crane to install them. When, when we went to Japan, we saw this one truly amazing standing Buddha that was about 25 feet tall. It was carved out of one piece of rock. But it was so big they couldn't get it through the tunnels in Japan and they had to cut... They no, they didn't cut the Buddha up. They had to cut the... so that it could fit. And then they came back and glued them back together. How big do you want it? They have they have a Buddha image that it must be over a hundred feet tall. Yeah, sure. There's a Buddha museum in Mandalay, there, and down the street from the Buddha museum, they make wooden Buddhas. Yeah. Like all in these shops, and you can get them as tall as a floor. That's not my favorite. Mandalay. Yeah, not the <laughs> 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 Yeah, and they ha they have a lot of that are made out of marble if you want them. Uh, they have one Buddha image that It got overgrown by the forest and they've been walking beside it just on a little trail for a few hundred years and somebody for some reason went inside and they looked up and they saw this Buddha image. It's 40 feet high. It's a lying Buddha. 40 feet high, 135 feet long. Well, it just got overgrown by the forest. Yeah. So, what size do you want? <laughs> well, you know, not everyone can afford a crane made by about twenty five hundred dollars just a day. Just to well, this is this is actually made out of bricks, and then plastered. So, uh, I've ordered two sitting Buddhas from Bali, and they're six feet tall. It takes four people to pick it up. That's about as big as I'm interested in. Depends where you get it. The sitting, the sitting Buddha that I'm getting is, well, they don't ship by weight because they're shipped by boat. That makes it easier. It's more volume. The sitting Buddha is, to buy it outright, would cost somewhere around $200. Sitting Buddha. <laughs> well, but that's palace full of stuff. Yeah, I I get a lot of stuff when I go to and then you truck it to Missouri. No, there's cement. Cement. Four people, did you say? Yeah. American Buddhists? It might be cheaper to bring the artisans over. Let's just learn how to make them ourselves. You know, we've got to pay for it.
they wrote some in Bali. Yeah. Yeah. There are villages in Bali where they just make um, Buddhas, uh, but, they, but they also make other kinds of uh, Hindu, Hindu um, yeah. uh, things as well. Just, and that's what they do in that village. And people in Bali are very, very deeply connected to their village, and they won't leave. So unfortunately, you have to get people from somewhere else. But I mean, you could start a school training artisans in Missouri to um, make <laughs> good images because they quite in demand. <laughs> Imagine we'll sell them to all those local churches. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not in demand in Missouri, but in California. <laughs> I think you'll find that there's a big, lots of them being made in China. Yeah, but I don't like the Chinese faces. Every uh, every country, they they make the Buddha image different, and one of the most beautiful to me is the Indian Buddhas because they have a Western face. He was an Aryan. He had blue eyes and golden skin. And they don't put the little uh, curly cues all over his head. They just leave his hair like it actually was. Now, I understand why they they put those curly cues on his head, because that's supposed to represent the pineal gland, the spiritual gland for the body. I thought it was snails. No. <laughs> no. God. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> No, there was a, the only being that I know of that did anything during his enlightenment period was when it started raining, a big snake came and covered him so that he wouldn't get cold or wet while he was sitting in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. <laughs> Okay, let's share some merit. <clears throat> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sah.